I am the Sumter County County Court Judge. I'm going to be giving you a presentation to try to give you the nuts and bolts of what county court is. Uh, just so you know a little bit about me, I have been the county judge here in Sumter County since last May 2016. I was appointed at that time when Judge Thomas Skidmore retired. Uh, I have, was before that a practicing lawyer for about 25 years uh, here in the circuit. And uh, if you're wondering, well, what is the circuit? That's something that we're going to touch on. You're also going to, not only is this the inaugural uh, uh, summit meeting, this is also the first time I've ever done a PowerPoint presentation, so do bear with me. Uh, as uh, Most of my experience was as a trial lawyer, both as a prosecutor and defending uh, citizens, and with that, I really uh, was always scared of the computer because inevitably, uh, kind of like I thought of it as like a NASA space mission, uh, something would go wrong, and so I wanted to have uh, everything printed out, I'd have photographs printed out, so inevitably when the computer stopped working or I would have my copies to hand out. So that being said, let's see where we get. What is county court? All right, let's see. See how, see how this works already? Let's see, is there a power switch here? Houston, we do have a, there we go. All right, all right, just a little disclaimer. Uh, I can't give legal advice. Judges are not permitted to give legal advice. Uh, we'll touch on that and why that is in a moment. So what I'm giving is not legal advice. Don't consider it as a substitute for legal advice. Uh, consider it as general knowledge. And do understand, are there exceptions to every rule? Unfortunately, typically there are. So do understand as well that if I touch on every exception, that everything I said, we'd be here probably an hour on each slide, and that would not be very entertaining. I can trust you that. So the goals are, as I discussed, let's have a nuts and bolts approach, not only I don't want to just tell you about certain statutes or such. I want to give you an idea of how the system works so that that can help you uh, and, uh, if you ever have to utilize uh, the courts. Number two, give you information that can try to make the courts be open and accessible to you because that is one of the things that courts are supposed to be, accessible to the people. And I do believe that, and I do want to try to see if we can accomplish that goal. And to do that, I'm going to try to keep it interesting uh, to promote learning. I wanted to give a test, but they told me I couldn't give a test. So uh, that being said, I've got to try to entertain you folks. And that's one of the things I want to comment about is that the court system is not meant to be entertaining. And so what you see here today is not what you would see in court. But once again, I'm not trying to put you to sleep. I'm trying to keep you folks awake. So once again, here's a good example of not open and accessible. And who can tell me uh, what this is from? Anybody have any idea? Wizard of Oz, of course. Anybody, you know, as a small child, we all, at least I remember, seeing this and it being ingrained in my mind. I did ask my assistant, I said, what is this from? And she said, I think that's from Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, and she wanted to argue with me. And she said, that looks like the thing in Ghostbusters. I said, it's not Ghostbusters. But if you remember the Wizard of Oz, remember, he did such a bad job. Not only when they banged on the door, he wouldn't open the door. He didn't want to give them a hearing. He didn't want to talk to them. And then he finally did open it up. There was a lot of shouting, yelling, smoke and fire. Certainly not the way we want our court system to be. But one of the things you know, we need to understand is, uh, once again, folks who have never been to court uh, may have this perception. So let me ask you folks, what do you folks think about when you think about court? Any of these come to mind? All right. I think about Matlock. He would always break the rule of when you're at, he's, he'd go from asking questions to testifying. He'd say, well, when I was out at your house, I looked through the window and I saw something, something, which is something that you really can't do. But uh, did anybody think of pickleball court? See, you could be out playing pickleball, but you're here at, with me instead. But uh, that is a, probably the most popular court in Sumter County. All right, and what you really probably thought about was this. Anybody, did anybody think about this? No, nobody thought about Judge Judy? Donna Miller, all right. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, this is uh, many people's perception of what a judge is and what a judge does. All right. And probably none of you thought about this. All right. Okay, so do remember that what's on TV, as we all know, even reality TV is TV, and uh, what reality is may be something very different. Your Honor, we find these proceedings to be much less interesting than what we see on TV. And, uh, you know, this is uh, funny because it's, it's uh, really true, you know, as far as, as, like we talked about with a space mission or an airplane, if everything goes really perfect, that really wouldn't be an interesting show. 
Uh, what makes it interesting is when the plane starts crashing or something seems to go wrong. So once again, uh, you know, TV is designed to entertain. I keep on using the word TV. It really should probably be social media the way, uh, you know, who watches TV anymore? Remember, purposes of TV is to entertain. What is the purpose of court? The purpose of court is to administer justice, resolve disputes, make decisions while treating all participants in the courtroom with respect. The purpose of court is not to be entertaining. And, uh, you know, once again, that is uh, something to, to, to be clear with. You know, and as far as treating folks with respect, uh, you know, I hearken back to my days as a uh, lawyer, and I had a client who said, I told him he was probably going to be going to prison, and he said, I really don't think that judge will send me to prison. I said, why? He treats me with respect. He asks me how I'm doing. He calls me sir. And I said, that's what a judge does. But that doesn't mean he won't send you to prison. And once again, maybe the perception that some folks may have is that a judge is supposed to yell, scream, and do those sort of things. And if a judge is treating someone with respect, they're maybe not doing uh, what we maybe perceive on TV. But that's certainly, once again, the difference between what's real and what's entertainment. All right, remember, I wanted to give you folks a nuts and bolts approach, so we're going to get, uh, tell you we are in Sumter County, if you didn't know. Now, where is the courthouse? Because I will say this is one of the most common questions I get asked when people find out I'm the judge. I said, and so who here does not know where the courthouse is? Everybody know? Who is, all right, see, exactly. All right, the courthouse is in Bushnell. All right, if you don't know how to get there, you head down 301 South, and you just keep on going, and eventually you hit a 90-degree curve, and there it is. And it was built in 1914, that is the historic courthouse, evidently built by the same architect who designed part of the University of Florida. That's why it's so pretty. Um, so uh, that being said, there is a new judicial center which is basically built onto that and basically looks very similar. So if you were going to go down there, that would not be the door you would go in. It would actually be on the side and you would go through. And once again, if you go to the courthouse, do expect uh, years ago when I started practicing law, you only had to go through security to get into the courtroom. At some point they decided the whole courthouse needed to be secured and I understand that. So do be prepared to go through metal detectors and such when you go into the courthouse for really any purpose. All right, and you'll think this is funny, but helpful hint, it's not Sumter County, South Carolina. In this day of the internet, when you Google Sumter County Clerk of Court, Sumter County Sheriff's Office, Sumter County, you'll come up with, with South Carolina. I did it myself as a practicing lawyer, and I looked down and say, that's not the clerk of court. I actually, as a judge, received phone calls about why orders hadn't been signed, and then turned out they had sent the orders to South Carolina. So that being said, do remember that when you're Googling things, make sure you're looking at Sumter County, Florida, and not Sumter County, South Carolina. That's why I always put the word Florida in. All right. Let's talk about the structure of the court. This gentleman here in the front was asking me about circuits and districts, and it's a very common uh, area, area that people are confused about, uh, particularly even my own dad stays confused. So, uh, That being said, at the very top we have the Florida Supreme Court. There's one of those. Underneath the Florida Supreme Court, we have the District Courts of Appeal. There are five districts, and we'll touch on that in just a minute, but we're going down in, uh, as far as from most important or highest court to lowest court. Under that, we have circuit courts, and then under that, we have county courts. So you can see that I am at the bottom of the totem pole, so to speak, but being at the bottom, basically, county courts probably have the most contact with the public. I see many, many, many people on many, many days. It is a high-volume uh, courtroom. Um, all right, Sumter is part of the Fifth Judicial Circuit. So here we are in Sumter County. I'm the county judge here. We are part of the Fifth Judicial Circuit. The Fifth Judicial Circuit is Marion Lake, Citrus, Sumter, and Hernando County. All right. We have circuit judges that are in the circuit as well. They are housed in the same courthouses that I'm housed. There are two circuit judges that sit here in Sumter County, though they have jurisdiction over the circuit. All right. The Fifth Judicial Circuit is part of the Fifth District Court of Appeal. The fact that it's the fifth and the fifth that is just coincidental. There are five district courts of appeal. There are 20 circuits, I believe. All right. Anybody have an idea where the fifth district court of appeal is? The hint is an appeal is no day at the beach. Daytona Beach. All right. But it really, it's, it is in Daytona Beach. And I, I did have the pleasure of 
uh, arguing before the fifth. And if you may see something talking about the DCA, that's the District Court of Appeal. I did have the privilege to argue before them on several occasions. And kind of like the Wizard of Oz, I went over there. I was nervous. For 25 years, I was nervous practicing law. I think it's a nervous energy. Someone told me one time, they said, Paul, you get nervous because you care. So I'll use that as my mantle. I don't know if it's, I assume it's true. I do care, certainly. But I went over there, and as I walked into the courtroom, papers I had in my hand somehow came loose. And this was my first, to first time in front of the 5th DCA. And you know how sometimes papers fall? But sometimes they don't fall. They fly like airplanes. And literally, they flew like that. <laughs> And I had to walk over here, and it's a three-judge panel. And then I had to walk over here and pick up my other paperwork. So uh, once again, you know, I try to harken back that and think that sometimes what becomes my backyard, so to speak, being in my courtroom, I'm familiar with it, is unfamiliar territory to a lot of people. And you do, as a judge, have to remember that. All right, and the Florida Supreme Court is where? In Tallahassee. All right, since we've talked about an appeal a little bit, let's just, just give you an idea of what is an appeal because a lot of people have a misperception. We see things all about appeals. Generally speaking, it's a review of the rulings of law by, made by the judge, seeing if the judge made a mistake in one of his rulings. Maybe he let evidence in that should not have been in. Maybe he uh, made some sort of ruling. So it's trying to basically see if the judge made a mistake. And what does that do? That helps make sure that the law is being uh, properly applied. We want the law to be properly applied. So it's good that people have the option to basically appeal and go before another judge and say, did Judge Militello make a mistake when he issued this ruling? It's not a do-over. You don't get to just say, well, I'm going to have someone else just hear the whole thing, or I didn't bring my photographs today, and I want an appeal so I can bring all my photographs that time. It's really got to be about uh, an error. And though we hear about it on TV a lot, reality speaking, and I think I've resolved 450 cases last month, not heard because I hear more than that, resolved, we closed them up. Uh, very few of those will be appealed. Um, all right, so how do we determine the number of judges in each county court? All right, it varies with the population and caseload of the county. Does anyone know how fast Sumter County is growing? Does anyone know it's, I think, five years running, the fastest growing county in the United States, percentage-based? I think it's grown 25% in so many years. And I kept stepping on the scale, seeing if I was growing 25%, but I don't think that's uh, re related. But uh, how many judges do we have? Marion has four county judges. Now, this is not circuit judges. Lake has three. Hernando has two. Citrus has one. And Sumter has one. Uh, I'm not sure. I think in Orange County, I think they have about 18 county judges. Um, you know, one of the benefits and uh, privileges that I have is being the only county judge, I really get to hear everything that comes before a county judge. I basically do it all as far as that's concerned. Uh, when I'd go to other conferences, literally talk to a judge in Miami who all he does is first appearance hearings and he sits in front of a TV and hooks up to three different jails every morning or basically all day and does first appearances. And uh, talk to a gentleman who was a judge in Orlando. He said, I don't ever go to the courthouse. I just go to the jail. That's how uh, busy they are. So uh, I, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to get to do uh, basically all of it. All right. What are the requirements to be a county judge? I have to be an elector of the county, which means I have to be registered to vote here, which means I have to live here. Uh, I practiced law in this circuit for 25 years, but I was actually a resident of Marion County. So I did uh, move to Sumter County, rented a house in the villages for about nine months, right over here close to Rohan, right, right here. Did come over and look at the pickleball courts with my tennis racket and look at them and wonder what they were for, for a while. But uh, so that being said, you also have to be a member of the Florida Bar for five years, which means you have to be licensed to practice law. And county judges do serve six-year terms here in Florida. All right. All right. What kind of cases do I hear in county court? What is my jurisdiction? Civil traffic offenses. Traffic court. Do we have a lot of traffic court in Sumter County? Yes, we do. We have both I-75 and the Turnpike. I don't know if there's another county that has both of those. But so there are certain days in court where I will have probably... 15 Florida Highway Patrol and 15 sheriff's deputies. Uh, and I wonder at that time who's out, uh, you know, protecting the community. But the courthouse will literally be uh, packed with deputies regarding speeding tickets and such. Some of the things that you may not be aware of is that uh, you can speed. And, and with speeding citations, it's not a criminal citation. You basically can receive fines, traffic school, and in some cases, license suspensions. But you can't be 
uh, put in jail for a civil citation. But 30 miles an hour over the speed limit is a mandatory court appearance and you could be fined up to $500. $50 over the, I'm sorry, 50 miles an hour over the speed limit has a uh, minimum mandatory or mandatory fine of $1,000. We do see careless driving and accident cases uh, there. Uh, uh, and a helpful hint would be uh, there's something called a clerk's option. You can make elections to take traffic school in certain cases and get no points. It'll be up to you to decide if that's what you wish to do, but I would just tell you, you need to do that before you pay the ticket. What I see over and over again is people will pay the ticket and then go do traffic school, and the points have then been assessed. Now, there have been cases where we set those aside and such, but really, once again, you know, read through it, talk to the clerks, they can explain to you how that works. It's really a benefit. No points means your insurance really shouldn't go up. At least that's what we would hope. All right. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. I just thought I'd touch on this. In traffic court, a lot of times I see move over violations. Is, who here, anybody not know what the move over law is? Who knows what the move over law is? All right, you got to basically move over when there's a police officer or an emergency vehicle on the side of the road, get and empty out that lane. A lot of times people show them, I didn't know that's the law. That's my defense. I didn't know it. Well, has anyone ever heard? Ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? You've heard that? Why is that? Why is it no excuse? Because then everyone would claim it. Then basically, if that was a de good defense, everybody would just show them and say, I didn't know cocaine was illegal, or I didn't know this. So, okay, if that's a good defense, then we'd have, you know. So that's why, basically, we're all presumed to know the law. Certainly, we don't know, all, you know, I don't know all the law. The books basically keep on continuing to get this big. But, uh, you know, certainly we all should be apprised of, uh, try, try to be familiar as good citizens with what the local laws are. All right, I also handle misdemeanors in traffic court. Misdemeanors are offenses that are punishable by up to a year in the county jail. Uh, very frequent ones are, that we see quite often are DUIs, driving while license suspended, petty theft, which is typically up to $300, marijuana less than 20 grams, a small amount of marijuana, and simple battery, which means no weapons or serious bodily injuries. Basically a slap, a push, a poke, uh, something like that uh, could constitute a simple battery. There you see the Sumter County Detention Center, which could be called the Sumter County Jail. If you're wondering where that is, that's located right behind uh, the courthouse. This is almost a view out of my uh, back door over there. I do go over there every morning to do first appearances, which is another one of my duties. All right, misdemeanors are criminal offenses. If you get charged with a misdemeanor, it is a crime. Do you have a right to a jury trial on a misdemeanor? Yes, you do. You have an absolute right to a jury trial, as guaranteed by the... Uh, Constitution, Constitution of the United States. Jail up to a year. Now some, when I put some 60 days, some misdemeanors are punished by up to a maximum of 60 days. No valid driver's license, driving on a suspended license, first offense, the most someone could receive would be up to 60 days. You could receive fines, community service hours, mandatory counseling in certain cases, restitution to victims. The statute does require that if uh, victims be uh, made whole, uh, uh, as far as if they've been the victim of a crime, and in Sumter County, we have somewhat of a unique uh, uh, Sumter County uh, weekend work detail. You may see that at some point if you're driving down 301 or such. Basically, I can sentence folks to serve a Saturday and Sunday or multiple Saturdays and Sundays, not being housed in the jail, but basically going to the jail in the morning and then driving around in a van with the sheriff's office and picking up trash on the side of the road. So not only is it uh, basically a, a punishment, it helps the community, uh, and it also helps people who are working perhaps not be in jail during the week uh, when they lose their job. Uh, let's see. You should realize that many misdemeanors, once again, these are there's exceptions to every rule, can be enhanced to felonies based on repeat or prior convictions. Driving on a DUI can become a felony after repeated times. Driving on a suspended license can become a felony. Petty theft, three offenses becomes a felony. Battery, a second offense becomes a felony. If things become felonies, then the maximum penalties are more than one year. Probably up to five years would be the lowest level of felonies punished by up to five years in the state penitentiary. Misdemeanors, people spend time in the county jail, typically. Felonies, people go to the state penitentiary. Felonies are outside the jurisdiction of county court. They would be heard in circuit court. So I would, would not be handling those matters typically. All right, small claims. Uh, Small claims is sometimes called the people's court. We have monetary disputes. We see breaches of contracts, credit card debts, medical debts, 
disputes less than $5,000. Small claims procedure. Small claims is designed, once again, to be the people's court. The amounts in controversy a lot of times are so little that it probably or may not be cost effective to hire an attorney. So basically, in small claims, you can go to the clerk's office and they will assist you, not giving legal advice, but assist you in the filing protocols to file it and to serve the other side and a court date would be set. These are all things that in a typical civil case you would have to figure out yourself, but we, we basically will set a court date. Just so you, un you understand, when you first come to pretrial in small claims, uh, we'll try to see if we can mediate the case and settle it. If we can't settle it, we'll set it for a trial date pretty quickly, typically about 30 days. At that trial, you do need to be prepared to come to prove your case, particularly if you're the plaintiff. You do need to have all witnesses, photos, and documents. Sometimes people show up and they'll say, well, I've got that receipt, but I left it at home. Do be prepared, once again. And uh, common hearsay issues, sometimes people want to bring letters from other peoples. This is what the guy said was wrong with this, or this is what my uh, neighbor was a witness, what they saw. If the other side objects to hearsay, which is an out-of-court statement offered for the truth, then it's probably going to be sustained, and I'll say, I can't read that letter. You really should have had Mr. Jones here. So once again, if the case goes to trial, you need to be prepared. As a practicing lawyer, preparation is a big part of a trial. If you're representing yourself, you need to be prepared as well. Once again, you may get nervous, write down notes. Be pre you know, Certainly those are things to do. Court typically can only award a judgment for money. Really, that's my jurisdiction in small claims matters is to give a judgment for money. I don't pull money out of my pocket. I would say, Ms. Smith, I give you a judgment. Mr. Jones owes you $500. It would then be up to Ms. Smith to try to collect on that judgment to see if the other person has property that can be taken and such. It can be very difficult to collect on a judgment. But you also need to understand, I can't make people do things. I can't say, Mr. Jones, now you go home tonight and you go ahead and go repair that or fix it or paint it over again or whatever. That could be done at mediation. He could agree, yeah, let's settle this. I'll go redo the work and get it done right or something to that effect. But I can't make people do things like that. All right. Above small claims or other matters that I do civilly is county court civil, landlord tenant evictions. Uh, get quite a few of those. Also, civil matters up to $15,000 are not small claims. The protocols are not simplified, but those are still heard by myself. What do you do if it's over $15,000? Then it'd be resolved in circuit court once again. And sometimes cases will start in front of me. The folks will realize the damages are more, and then the case will be transferred up to circuit court. All right. One of the things that I get to do as a county judge is be the chairman of the county canvassing board. Uh, I got to participate in the presidential election right when I first uh, uh, was basically uh, coming on. And what a tremendous experience, basically, to oversee as a neutral and impartial observer and basically make sure uh, the protocols were being done right. We also review the absentee ballots. Uh, and my hint on this would be, and once again, something I never realized, if you're doing an absentee ballot, sign your name the way you sign your name on your voter registration. Don't have your wife sign it. Don't just put an X or a scribble. Someone is really looking at that. And before we ever open it up, we try to look and see if it matches. If it doesn't matches, match, the supervisor of election tries to contact you to say, we need to, you want to come in and see if this is your ballot or such. But once again, I really never thought much about it when I was doing it myself. So these are things that you learn. Also, just double check the ballot. We would run them through the uh, machine. If they go fine, they're counted superb. If the machine kicks them out as a canvassing board, we would look at them and try to ascertain what the voter's intention was. Sometimes people would say they'd cross through a name and then put a circle. It was pretty easy to figure out. But sometimes people would vote for both parties on the same race. If they do that, it doesn't count. So once again, always go through and check. They'll always give you another ballot if, if need be. County judges can also be assigned to do circuit work. I've been assigned through an order that allows me to do circuit court if need be. And I do uh, uh, get to oversee the treatment courts, which Judge Lant is going to talk uh, about treatment courts at some, uh, coming up. But, so I do oversee the Sumter County Veterans Treatment Court as well as the Sumter County uh, Drug Court. These are treatment courts that are very intensive. They basically meet uh, much more often than regular court. And with the effort to try to take people who otherwise 
uh, would be law-abiding and try to give them services or treatment or, in fact, punishments to try to keep them curtailed. But uh, I'll let Judge Lant uh, touch on that. All right, let's talk a little bit about what the rule of a judge is. Uh, we all live in a democracy. I think we're all proud to live in a democracy. Uh, but we don't necessarily think of judges when we think of democracy. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what the role is, the legislature uh, it represents the people. They're supposed to go out, talk to the community, find out what laws we as citizens want passed. They then create the law. The judge is bound to follow the law. I'm not supposed to be creating my own law. I'm not supposed to be going out and saying, what do you think uh, uh, the law should be? I'm supposed to look and basically interpret the laws that's been uh, uh, put forth by the legislature. That way the people should expect that the judge is going to follow the law and be neutral and impartial. We all know this, our legislatures. We could go, some of them would say, I like the, uh, you know, I think the law should be this way. The other guy should say, my platform is this way. You wouldn't want to go to court and say, what's the judge's platform on this? Is he this way or is he that way with this particular uh, issue? You'd want to know, no, the judge follows the law. And so once again, that gives us as citizens the understanding of uh, understanding a little bit how the system works. So, All right. Judge is prohibited from giving legal advice. Understand this is a very common question. I, once again, I understand why wouldn't you want to ask a judge. You think he probably knows how to give uh, good legal advice. A judge has to be neutral and impartial and avoid doing or saying anything that gives the appearance of being biased or prejudging cases or types of cases. So if you ask me, judge, what do you think about this sort of thing, or how would you handle this? If I start prejudging something before I've heard the facts, I'm going to box myself in and basically put myself in a position where you say, he's already biased. He hadn't even heard the facts, and he already told me this is what he thinks about that or something. Think about an umpire. An umpire calls balls and strikes. What would you do if during the baseball game they said, yeah, the umpire's over with the uh, Yankees, and he's basically giving them some pointers on the best way to proceed on the case. He's giving them... Uh, baseball advice. You'd say, he's not being neutral and impartial. He can't do that. He's the umpire. Now, extra credit points. Anybody know who, who that gentleman is? We have any Yankee fans here? All right. Very good. Ex extra point for you. All right. All right. This uh, ex parte communication. Uh, this is to explain some of the things that judges do that you say, you know, why do, why do judges behave this way? I don't understand. Uh, we're all familiar with steak and shake. And the slogan, in sight, it must be right. I thought that meant that the kitchen was open and you could see them cooking your burger. Uh, but when I read on the internet, and of course, as we joked earlier, everything on the internet is always correct. Basically, in 1934, when the gentleman started Steak and Shake, people were concerned about ground beef. They were distrusting of it. So he would put the grinder in the middle of the restaurant and he would bring out the food and he, the steaks and he would grind it so you would see what's going in the hamburger. So the result that came out, you got to see everything that went into it to make that result. And basically, an ex parte communication is what judges can't do, prohibited. I can't talk with one side. You call up and say, I need to talk to the judge. I want to tell him about my case tomorrow. Judge wouldn't take my call. Can you believe it? The victim. The victim called. She wanted to talk to the judge, and the vic judge said he would not talk to the judge. I don't know why the judge is doing that. Well, think along these lines. If we had a hearing and I said, I talked to some people last night. I kind of understand what's going on here. You'd say, what? You did what, judge? Can I listen to people? Absolutely. A job of a judge is to listen. It needs to be done in open court when everyone hears what's being said. So even when I rev review things on a computer in front of someone who's in court, I say it out loud so that he hears it. Because sometimes I'll say, it says here you have a DUI in St. Petersburg. No, no, that's not me. And we do some, oh, it wasn't you. But if I just read it, then basically I'd be putting something into the mix that he wasn't aware of. He wouldn't know that that was something that I had done. So once again, I can't conduct my own investigation. That would be being not neutral and impartial. I've got to base my decision on the information provided in court. So sometimes uh, there may be complaints that the not... the not the right information was presented to the judge. Once again, I can't be the one who goes out there and looks for it. It's basically up to the parties to make sure that the judge has the right information to make the right decision. All right. The judge shall be patient, dignified, and courteous to litigants, jurors, witnesses, lawyers, 
and others with whom the judge deals with in an official capacity. Once again, being polite and courteous may not always appear to be entertaining. And I guess that's what I'm just, the point I'm trying to make with this. But no matter what the ruling, and certainly judges make rulings that are unpopular, we sentence people which may be at times unpopular or popular, certainly everyone deserves to be treated uh, with respect. Uh, with that being said, right. you may come into contact with me as a juror. It will be a pleasure in a, to have you there. I think it will be a wonderful experience. Once again, for the extra credit, anybody can tell me who the gentleman on the right is? Yeah, there you go. Just the facts, man. All right. As a juror, it is your civic duty. I know we hear that. More than ever as a judge, I find that to be true. It is almost like being drafted, and I'm not trying to make light of the military. It, it doesn't compare to being in the military, but you are being asked to basically take part of your life, part of time, it may be just a week, and basically come to the courthouse, whether or not you really wanted to or not, and do your civic duty, a duty that really can't be done without you. I know sometimes they say, well, just go ahead and do it without me. It's something that can't be done, because the U.S. Constitution requires the right to a jury trial. It gives us all that. And there's things in the Constitution, you'll see things being litigated, and people say, well, is that in the Constitution or not? You'll never hear anybody say, well, I don't know if that's in there, because it's in there. It basically says right to a jury trial. And that is part of what I think is democracy at work. Think about it. Basically, our, our forefathers put forth the Constitution basically to make sure government did not get too powerful. So what more power as someone to be able to say, I want six people, six citizens to hear my case, not that guy who sits down there at the courthouse. So that being said, that is truly democracy at work. What do jur juries do? That's why I put uh, Joe Friday up there. Juries determine what the facts are. Judges basically would instruct you on the law. Basically, I would say, if you find that, for instance, the blood alcohol level is over X, Y, Z, then that person could be guilty. Then you would determine from the facts, did the state prove whether or not he was over or under the legal limit, or what did the evidence prove? Did it prove the case? So, once again, why should my fact finding basically, uh, you know, the collective uh, wisdom of the community and five citizens? And I would say this, as an in Sumter County, we get wonderful juries, life experiences, different vocations, different places of the country. It's always a pleasure with that. Here's just some photographs of the uh, courtroom, just so you can get an idea. This was the summer we did a teen academy the sheriff's office had put on, and uh, I was happy to do a moot trial for them. And this thing basically uh, took off with a life of its own. First, we started thinking about where we're going to do something about someone stealing the gingerbread or something like that. No, we ended up doing basically a miniature DUI manslaughter trial where uh, and it was all, of course, fake facts. A boyfriend had crashed while he was intoxicated and his girlfriend had been killed in a car wreck. And uh, uh, we asked for members of the community to help. We had the elected public uh, defender. We had members of the state attorney's office, uh, certainly members of the sheriff's office. And we put forth a trial, and I really think everybody really came out uh, in full steam to basically put this case on and the kids listened. We had several juries going at the same time. We got to watch them deliberate and uh, uh, boy the thought process they put into it. And if you look in the bottom right, we had two young men who were acting as bailiffs and after the guilty verdict came back, they said, can we approach the bench? And they came up to me and I said, yeah. And they said, they said can I put the handcuffs on them? <laughs> so I said, Yes, okay, go ahead. So the uh, gentleman who was the defendant was an investigator at the public defender's office. He was a good sport, and he let the handcuffs be put on him, and they took him back in the holding cell, and then we let him out. But, uh, so that was a really good experience. If uh, you always know the courthouse is open. It is open to the public. The courtrooms are open to the public. Certainly, you know, you can't go in there with a Coke and a popcorn and ask me questions or whatever, but you're always welcome uh, to be there. Uh, so... I get asked that question, can we come down and look? You can always call the clerk's office and ask them what's going on. Things have trials sometimes go away. People will uh, settle their cases right before certain trials, but uh, you're always welcome to be down there. And uh, this is just, once again, getting back to this issue. If you do come down, how many times would we want the guy in the airplane to check the gas gauge before he flies? Two, three, maybe have another guy look at it too or something, right? Uh, you know, that may not be entertaining. I'm sure if we looked at the pilot flying a successful flight over and over again, we say, okay, now he's going to check the gas again. Uh, one of the things, if you come down and see, you'll see me, every person who enters a plea before me, I will say, do you understand, sir, that you're, or ma'am, that you're giving up your right to a jury trial? 
It's more complicated than that. It'll take me about four minutes to go through all the questions I need to ask. Um, once again, uh, to make sure that we're doing it right because we don't want to hear later on that I didn't understand that I didn't have a right to a jury trial. And even though I've said it before to 100 other people in the courtroom, someone will get up and I'll say, do you understand you're giving up your right to a jury trial? And they'll look at me. You know, and uh, once again, that's, that's okay. Um, uh, and one of the things we have that addresses that is the clerk does keep an audio recording of all criminal proceedings, commonly called the blue man. And that's that little light you see over. This is actually in the courtroom this morning at first appearance. I'm sure Anthony will be happy that I put him up on the slide. But uh, so there is a record of what's being said. Uh, and that does protect all of us. And once again, we can go back and listen and hear if the person answered the questions and how they answered them. Once again, trying to make sure an ounce of prevention, then that's how we prevent having to handle cases over and over again. If you want more information, you can go to circuit5.org. It's a website put forth. Uh, you can see. Uh, 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 who the different judges are and matters of that. You can also check there's now Facebook and Twitter. I think it's under Fifth Judicial Circuit. Is it a Florida, Jeff, or just Fifth Judicial Circuit? And that's basically it. Thank you all uh, for being here. I hope you uh, did learn and learn something uh, that you can take with you today. Thank you.